Located in the heart of Dublin's north inner city, one place has provided acute paediatric care for almost 140 years. A home from home which offers safety at times of uncertainty. This building tells a story of hope, determination and strength. And tonight we go behind its doors to share the stories from the theatres and wards, to meet the staff who dedicate their lives to the care of Ireland's children, and to follow the journey of families and their little patients who are in need of vital and life-saving treatment. Welcome to Temple Street Children's Hospital. A new morning at Temple Street Children's Hospital. Upstairs in the St. Gabriel's Ward, Kalisha is waiting with her parents ahead of surgery. Back about a year and a half ago, Kalisha, coming up to her birthday, she got uh, very sick. She was at school and we were told to take her home from school. We brought her to the doctor and he rushed us straight to Monagar Hospital. They'd done x-rays and CAT scans and things like that on her. And uh, the next day they diagnosed her as having a tumour on the back of her cerebellum. What's your favourite one? On the Friday of the same week, she m went under major surgery to remove the tumour. In the process of her recovery, she uh, had complications and uh, she had to be induced into a coma for seven days. Basically, her mobility was affected, her eyesight was affected. She had a long recovery. We were eight weeks between Beaumont and Temple Street here in hospital. Wear slippers. No, no, wear slippers. Yeah. had a brain tumour uh, approximately a year and a half ago. This had to be removed by one of my colleagues, Mr. John Curd, and as a result of that, she has ended up with a facial palsy, which means that one of the nerves to the left side of her face doesn't function properly. So when I initially met uh, Kalisha, I was asked to see her in relation to the fact that she couldn't smile and this is a major issue for her. She's not able to show any emotions and uh, children growing up like this will find it very, very difficult, particularly when they're trying to make friends, expressing their emotions with their peers and smiling and so on. So it's a very important part of the, uh, the process in growing up. Today in theatre, Mr. Murray will begin to restore Kalisha's smile and give her back one of her biggest dreams. Her eye won't close properly and that her, her cheek is hanging. She eventually got back to school, not every day, but bits, bits and pieces of the day. The people from Make-A-Wish came out and gave her a wish and everything like that and she said that she was granted three wishes and one of her wishes was to have her smile back. Meanwhile in admissions, Callum has arrived ahead of surgery. Callum is here today to get a, um, a second operation on his, on his clip leg. He just had one other surgery before today and now he's getting a follow-up procedure. Okay. He was born five weeks premature and he had his first operation at six months old which closed the clip lip. He started school last September and he's also getting speech therapy which is great and he's getting extra curriculum reading in school which has brought him on great but doesn't seem to bother Callum at all. Anne McGillivary meets Callum's parents to explain details of the procedure. 
When children are born with a cleft lip and palate, I'm the first contact, if you like, for the team on behalf of Miss Early and the cleft team in Temple Street. And as you can see, we've little Callum coming in today. This is his second surgery for his cleft. Initially, when he was born, he had an open cleft lip. Miss Early would have repaired that. Now, his delay was at around six months because he was a premature baby. Normally, the protocol is the babies are their lips are repaired at three months. Uh, Callum has a cleft lip only, so today's surgery is about revising the initial repair that he had and he's also going to have some revision surgery to his nose and the alar base just to improve from a cosmesis point of view his appearance. Will he have um, kind of bandage, any invasive no, bandage? No, he'll or? have no invasive bandage at all. Sometimes with children when they're born with a cleft because there's no support behind the nasal, uh, the nose or the nasal ridge, the alar base is quite flat. So the primary surgery is done at three months as we say but this is to revise to improve his appearance of the nasal alar base. He's very energetic, lively, independent. As he was five weeks early, he was only five pounds seven ounces and he was absolutely tiny. And he came back with boxing gloves on and white bandages. His nose was all red as well, so like it's always worrying when they're going down, especially when you have to give them the anaesthetic and you know he's going to be upset and you're more upset yourself, but I know he'll bounce back if you grant. Downstairs in the St. Bridget's Ward, Carl has arrived with his mum for his weekly appointment. Hello. To be the man of the hour, Mr. Popular. Are we ready? Yeah. No, why not? <laughs> you get your arm? Carl was born in April 2007. Everything was fine. We had no cause for concern. And when he was, um, was in February 2009, his belly button just stuck out. So we brought him to, to Tala Hospital, actually. Orange. <coughs> orange bubbles, yeah. We got an appointment with the paediatrician and she luckily had a me metabolic background and um, she thought that Carl had what's called an MPS disorder. And then we they ran some tests and he was diagnosed with MPS2, which is Hunter syndrome. What do we need? He was transferred to Temp Street for care and he started this enzyme replacement therapy in November 2009. And Edna's gone to lunch. She's gone to lunch. lunch. No, where's Catherine? Dotson. <laughs> they told us about the condition that it's it's um it's rare, it's progressive, and um, so basically it will get worse as he gets older. Oh, done. Who's the best boy? Yeah. Because he's he's deficient in an enzyme that breaks down sugars. They what they do is they store in all the soft tissue area of his body, so it affects all his vital organs, his liver, spleen, heart. Um, everything it restricts his mobility at the moment like he's he's doing very well but obviously he can't do run as fast maybe as a normal four-year-old child and he does wear splints to help him walk f flat on his feet oh, oh look at that one get that one quick quick well, I, I had a brother who had the condition and I know what it what it has done to him and like unfortunately he died 25 years ago so yeah I mean you're watching every single little thing that, that goes on in his life, like you are watching him like a hawk. Every part of his body, yeah, every, the, the vital organs, the brain, um, joints, muscles, everything. It affects every single part of the body. Show to you, yeah. give a big blow. Oh, you nearly blew me away. Upstairs, Callum is being prepared for theatre. Yeah. I have to go all the way around over here. Callum has just arrived on the ward and we're just getting him ready for theatre. And we just try to make him feel comfortable and reassure him to show him the toy press, very important, and, and maybe get the play specialist down because he's he is quite nervous. There's one, look. Did you get that one? We did low for it, you know me then? As his dad said, he's... He's grand, like, do you know what I mean? Even, like, people would say to me, like, I'd say, like, Callum was born with a clip lip. They'd say, didn't even notice he was born with a clip lip. He's still your own child at the end of the day, even when he was born first, like, it didn't matter to me. What's the next challenge? You do spend a lot of time with the parents and trying to reassure them. Being supportive for the parents, because they can be more nervous than the children. 
and it really is about putting them at ease because they do get upset as well when the child's going down. So. Go ahead, help her. Oh, oh, this is cool. Nah. Yeah. Callum was born with a complete cleft lip and palate. So he's had his lip repaired, he's had his pal palate repaired, and he's also had an operation for his gum as well. At the moment, has come in for further surgery to his lip, where it's not always correct the first time you do it. So this is a revision of his cleft lip repair. The nose, as he has grown, has become slightly flattened and slumped down. It's easier to think of it in a couple of parts. The first part would be all aimed at repairing the cleft lip again and making sure that all its various elements were lined up properly. So in other words, the pink part of the lip, the white part of the lip and the base of the nose. The most important thing is to get the muscle repaired and get the skin trim. Any child that's born with a cleft lip and palate will have a set series of operations. They'll always need an operation to repair the lip, they'll always need one to repair the palate, and they'll always need one to repair the gum. So they will have at least three operations. But quite often they'll need another operation to revise the lip, or maybe to improve the palate for their speech, or various other things, or the nose might need an operation. Nervous. <laughs> See how he's going to react to the anaesthetic now because he is a little bit anxious now at this stage and it's been a long day. But sure, like he's in the best hands. He's always your child, and when you see them getting upset, you're going to get upset. In theatre, Mr. Murray has begun the process of restoring Kalisha's smile. She is like somebody who has had a stroke. The muscles on that side of her face, in terms of the muscles of facial expression, don't function. And given that she's now almost a year and a half after the surgery, it's very unlikely that she's ever going to get a new recovery unless we do something about it. Essentially, it's a bit like if you have um, a radio with a cable and the cable doesn't work because there's no power going through the cable. So you have to find a, a separate source of electricity into the radio and that's similar with the muscles of the face. The nerve and the muscles were functioning but the power behind the nerves wasn't. So what we had to do was to try and take a power supply from somewhere else and plug it into the nerve of the face. There are five branches, it's very, very complex, and it's very difficult to substitute those, uh, that power supply in, in, in a very precise fashion. The first step was to find the branches of the facial nerve that supply all the muscles of facial expression in, in, uh, on that side. And this is a very difficult and tedious part of the procedure. Um, the nerve goes through a gland, the parotid gland, which is a gland that produces saliva. And it's very important that you don't disrupt the function of that gland, but also that you don't disrupt the potential function of any of the nerves that may go on to recover. So having found the appropriate branches, we're able to stimulate them in theatre, and we're able to find the branches that produce the smile. Once we found those branches, we then had to look for a new nerve that would essentially give power to those, uh, that nerve. And that was done by uh, taking a nerve off one of the other muscles, which is much deeper, um, but in a very close proximity to the, to the nerve. We chose to try and get the nerves that affect the muscles that produce the smile. We took a nerve from a completely separate set of muscles, which is one of the muscles of mastication, in, in other words, chewing and we were able to dissect that little nerve out and essentially tack it onto the nerve of the muscles of facial expression. It all started from Christmas time. She wasn't feeling well at Christmas and it just kind of seemed to be 
getting sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker and losing her balance and everything like that. Not in her wildest dreams did we realise it was that serious. Mm. Never, even to the day that the doctor in Munigar told us that she had a tumour, we still didn't realise the particular she was so sick. Time the surgery right up to now. She's she's never looked back. She's kept both myself and Siobhan and her sisters and brother very strong. She never gave up once. And it's because of this today with Dylan Murray that she wants her smile back. So we have to try and grant her a wish. Meanwhile, Colm is still in surgery. The only reassurance I can ever give parents with a child with a cleft is that we have two goals. One is a normal appearance and the other is normal speech. It's, it's essential to have a multidisciplinary team. Initially, it's usually the plastic surgeon for the lip repair and the first panel repair. Uh, after that, it is speech and language and they are very, very involved in the progress of the child and development of speech. We continue to follow him up at the clinics and the next operation for him would be an operation on the gum for a bone graft. That's usually for boys in and around nine. He should be okay, just keep him comfortable for the night. Um, if he doesn't tolerate anything to eat or drink, we'll put him up on IV fluids and um, in the morning they give him his breakfast. We're hoping that he will go home tomorrow, but that's depending how he gets on. He's got his lip up, he was missing a bit on his upper lip, you know. His hair so he has, he has a lip oh, at the top now anyway, so. Yeah, they had to open yeah. up his existing scar, so it'll go to the process now to... to, to spiders, yeah. Looks like he's been in a row. <laughs> In the St. Bridget's Ward, Carl is beginning his treatment. Each week he arrives at the hospital for a rare and unique procedure, his only option in fighting what is at present an incurable syndrome. This little vial of medicine here costs about 3,000 euro. It's an enzyme replacement. He's missing an enzyme that breaks down certain toxins within the system. These toxins will eventually build up in the bones, in the joints, in the organs. Obviously you asked like is there a cure, like is somebody working on a cure? We know trials are going on at the moment to get it through to the, to the brain because this treatment doesn't get through the blood-brain barrier. If he didn't get this enzyme, the toxins would build up in his system and would gather in his bones, in his joints, in his organs. <laughs> Basically his joints will seize up. He will start gathering um, toxins within his liver, within his, basically his organs, um, in the brain, and without this treatment, his condition would continuously deteriorate. Now, here we come. Hi, Carl. Well, we were very lucky that he was as he was put on it fairly quickly after he was diagnosed, like within. Um, five months he was on the treatment. The only things that have happened so far is, is when the belly button stuck out that time it was actually a hernia and they are prone to hernias so he actually ended up getting three hernias one the, in the belly button Mommy. and two in the groin. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. I'll open these. So he had them repaired in February 2010 and then in July 2010 he had another surgery to remove his tonsils and adenoids because they were enlarged and they were restricting his breathing. And that's it. I lost my brother when he was 11, so that was a big thing. Like, you know, was I going to lose my son at that age? But um, thankfully, things have moved on, like in, in 
30 years and this treatment is now available so it slows down the progression of the disorder and they say at the moment he's only showing a very mild form of it. Yeah. Our hopes for Carl is that obviously that he continues to do as well as he does, that the condition won't affect him too badly and that he will have a good quality of life and live to a good age. That's all we want for him. Meanwhile, Kalisha is on her way back to the ward to be reunited with her parents. Nerve healing is probably one of the most difficult things in, in uh, surgery and medicine. From trying to understand it to try and, and develop how we might improve nerve healing. We do know that once the nerve has been put together, it takes approximately a month for the nerve, nerve fibres to grow through the suture line, so the stitch line. And then once it's done that, it, the nerves will continue to grow at approximately a millimetre per day until they reach their final destination, which is the muscle that they're supplying. One wouldn't expect any response for at least a month, maybe six weeks. And then after that, hopefully, we'll start seeing some twitching. Then over a period of about three to six months, some function will regain. The important thing here is, is there's two main issues. One of them is that the muscles in your face in your resting position are normally have a tone which is what gives you a symmetrical face. If you lose that tone, then the face appears to have fallen on, on one side. So at the very least, if we were able to get some tone, she may not be able to move the face terribly well or move the muscles of the face terribly well, but if we were able to maintain some of the tone, that would be of huge benefit to her. The other important thing is that the nerve that is now supplying these muscles has a completely different function. It's the nerve that's used to help you chew. So initially, she's going to have to start to learn to smile by clenching her teeth. Now, over a period of time, we find, particularly in younger children, that they then develop the ability to smile subconsciously without using the chewing technique. Glad to have her back. Yeah, she seems fine. Glad to be back with Mum. He said he'd done what he wanted to do anyway, so he's good. Let's get to them. She has to keep kind of grinding to make it and eventually touch wood, it'll all come.